I think student success begins with first understanding what students view as success. I think too often in higher ed, we we try to define what, what success looks like and we try to fit it within our neat frameworks and, and institutionally what we have and maybe what has been successful over the past hundred years. But, but this generation, I think more so than any, is really shifting that on its, on its head and forcing institutions to reevaluate how are we defining student success and maybe even not how are we defining it, how are students defining it and how are we reacting or engaging with them on, on their turf. Ah, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back at it again. You are in the club, powered by Club Colors. I'm excited today. We've got folks with so many letters behind their name. I'm not sure that I am qualified to even have this podcast. It's interesting to me to think about higher education as a business, but that is exactly what we are talking about here. How does higher education and the fine folks that steward those brands, how do they take their clients, which are students, to the next level? That's what it's all about. And Club Colors, of course, is proud to represent brands and go ahead and do that. We've got two fantastic guests on. We're doing a virtual setting here, but I've also got my partner in crime, Mr. Chris Jager, joining me today. Let me introduce to you a couple of folks that have tremendous, tremendous chops and background expertise, and I'm looking forward to learning, and that's what these podcasts are all about, is learning what the best and the brightest in the industry have to offer. So first off, we've got Dr. Eric Kirby. Uh, Dr. Kirby is director of the MBA program and an assistant professor of management, leadership, and business law in the Dixie L. Levette School of Business at Southern Uni- Utah University. My gosh, that's a lot to, to get out. We're talking about uh, business management and law. Holy cow. After practicing law for nearly a decade, Dr. Kirby shifted to higher education, where he more recently served as the assistant vice president for student affairs at SUU. We're definitely going to have to get in that. And also, we've got uh, Mr. or excuse me, Dr. Jared Tippett. Uh, and Dr. Tippett currently serves as Vice President of Student Affairs at Southern Utah University. His professional career has been spent focusing on retention, completion, and student success efforts, as well as organizational change on both the academic affairs and student affairs side of the academy. Prior to SUU, He worked at Purdue University, University of Kentucky, and University of Missouri, Columbia, and Utah Valley University. My gosh, talk about a world traveler. He's been all over the place, and those are some premier universities. So we look forward to getting into it with both of you. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us in the club. How do you feel today? Hey, great. Hey, yeah, we're honored. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So, Chris, uh, you obviously have a chance to interact with folks in very high positions in higher education. But I'm curious, gentlemen, and I'll start with you, Eric. Please uh, elaborate a little bit on what what do you find is most important in your role? Obviously, anything that you do uh, that you're successful at, you typically have a passion for it. So what is the passion that you have for higher education and how has that led to success at the role that you have currently? Yeah, I, I think the passion has to stem for one, believing in the cause, but I think second, having the, the desire to see others succeed and in fact be better than you ever were or could be. That those would be my two two driving passions for what led me to higher ed and keeps me in it. That's amazing. How about you, Dr. Uh, Tippett? Yeah, I think very similar to what Eric said, but you know, I had um, a great experience in college. And I reflect often on how I lived in a house with 12 different guys. We had this big house. um, And it was just so interesting how I would look at them and their college experience and compare it against mine. I thought I was having the best college experience ever. Some of them were kind of disconnected and disinterested and were just sort of going to class and collecting a degree. And, you know, I wanted so bad to work in higher ed and try to create these experiences for all students to just love their institution, love the experience, uh, take advantage of all of the uh, opportunities in and out of the classroom to grow and develop and prepare for kind of the next phase of life. 
So that that's the passion. That's what keeps me up at night. How can I help more students have a fantastic transformational life experience in college? Both of you have played a role in student success. So there's, as it relates to the brand, you know, student success has a lot of different meanings. Kind of de- describe as it relates to the role, what student success means, not only in the role, but in the way that you might approach that role. Yeah, I'll jump in and, and, and share a little bit about how student success impacts the brand, right? I, I think particularly with our students today, Gen Z students, right? They are looking at colleges and universities as a place where they go and get prepared for careers and jobs and those sorts of things. Um, And it's just so fascinating how every institution is sort of looking through the student success lens or talking about it a little bit differently and what it means, you know? So for one institution, student success, the brand of, of student success, if you will, will be lifelong learning, kind of that liberal arts perspective, come, it's the life of the mind, come and learn all you can, um, learn how to think critically and to be a, you know, a, a productive citizen and those sorts of things. Well, other institutions are sort of taking this uh, approach where college is about career and job preparation and, and getting ready for grad school or whatever's next in life, right? And, um, and so we try to think about, okay, what do our students want from us? And how do we uh, create that brand through the experiences that we offer and provide to our our students here? And at Southern Utah University, uh, one of our challenges has been for a long time, we're sort of, we sort of bounce between these two brands, if you will, as it relates to student success. Um, And and maybe that is the right place to be, the best of both worlds. Um, But we certainly know with Generation Z coming to campus, they are, they're more interested oftentimes in more of that career and professional development brand of higher education. So, I don't know, Eric, what would you add to that? Yeah, I think you hit a lot of the key components on the head. I think student success begins with first understanding, you know, what students view as success. I think too often in higher ed, we, we try to define what, what success looks like and we try to fit it within our neat frameworks and, and institutionally what we have and maybe what has been successful over the past hundred years. But, but this generation, I think more so than any, is really shifting that on its, on its head and forcing institutions to reevaluate how are we defining student success and maybe even not how are we defining it, how are students defining it and how are we reacting or engaging with them on, on their turf. I, I think consequently in light of Gen Z, we're going to see a rise in badging systems to help create these milestones to keep them engaged. I think we're going to see a rise in certificates. I think we're going to see a rise in technical degrees that need to be offered. I think we're going to see a rise in maybe instead of a four-year degree, a a three-year degree uh, for a bachelor's. Um, I think we're going to find more internships and and externships and apprenticeships that need to come on that higher ed needs to start engaging. I think we're going to see a shift in curriculum to be more career-focused and more hands-on because we have to meet how these students are are defining success. If If you can't give the customer what they want, it, it's going to be really tough to stay relevant in business. Now, having said that, while we're talking about Gen Z, we, we have to keep in mind that they are one of the customers, right? They're, they're a big customer, right. and they're gobbling up mm-hmm. a huge spot in that market and will continue to. But we continue to need to meet the, the demands and, and find success among our online students or those who have, have been out of higher ed for 20 years and just need a few more classes to, to graduate, uh, those who are maybe in our graduate program. So, while definite change needs need to be made to meet the new success, we have to keep in mind the stuff that has made us successful and, and help students find success in the past because many students are still looking for uh, those type of things as well. Such an interesting answer because what it sounds like to me is that there is a recognition that the, the attention span of the human being has changed. The ability to acquire information through technology has changed. And it sounds like what you're saying is there's still an amazing offering, but you've got to almost condense it and create some of the rewards and recognition of achievement closer to their nose, faster um, and more directly impactful to um, 
their their desired outcome, whatever that role is, instead of real general studies really honing in on a specific and making it very close to their nose as it relates to their certification, the paper they get, the rewards that they get, and how quickly they can get through that process. Yeah, I, that's such a good point. You know, John, I I often think about higher education, at least, so the analogy I guess I would use, given the work that you gentlemen are in, right, is um, the styles of clothing change all the time. Yes. And um, and so the customers who are buying the clothes look for modern styles. Higher education needs to change its style. Um, but the problem is if you were to go back 100 years in time uh, and walk onto a campus, you would still find your way around 100 years ago because nothing's changed. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. the buildings are old and still look old, and in many ways, that's really awesome, and it's and it's um, really cool part of higher education. But yeah, I, that's part of our challenge in higher ed is the styles have changed, but higher education is not necessarily changing with it. And then we wonder why students are voting with their feet or shopping somewhere else, mm-hmm. right? Because they're coming into the store and they see all these, um, you know, plaids or. Uh, what you know, polyester or whatever is in on the racks, and that was so 19 years ago, 25, 30 years ago, whatever it is. Does that make sense? That analogy, yeah, yeah. Um, we just got to get better at it. I, I think that's interesting, and you think about I, I think about my own journey. So, I, I graduated college in 2010, and just how much things in the college marketplace have changed, even just in what 13 years. Um, it changes fast and you have to be able to react and pivot at the speed that the marketplace changes. And in the case of Gen Z, I mean, there's a lot of things that have fueled their mindset and where they're coming from and ultimately where you need to meet them that really shape how you craft, how you go to into higher education in terms of the programming you're offering, those certificates you mentioned, the ability to create specialized pathways, all of those things that come into the conversation now. And just not that long ago, some of those things weren't even on the table. Now you have to have a whole table for it. So it's interesting to see how quickly things can evolve and how it drives the conversation and then ultimately the service that the university provides to their students. Yeah, it, it, it is moving at an extremely fast pace, and it's amazing little things such as COVID or pandemics, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. I hope you can sense the sarcasm there with little, how quickly that can change. Yes, Gen Z was... Uh, gearing toward more flexibility, and yes, they they wanted more of that instantaneous kind of result. But but COVID absolutely skyrocketed those those demands and needs. Yeah. And so, consequently, higher ed is is stuck with regards to COVID. It, there seems to be this lingering thought of we we will quickly return back to normal. That that, that the normal pre-COVID world will eventually creep back in, and and. And I don't see it going that direction. Not only did Gen Z, but the rest of us got hints and, and flavors and tastings of certain things that COVID offered yep. or the time that I don't know that we'll ever go back for. From work flexibility to being able to have the education delivered remotely to, to wherever you're at, the ability to work on the other side of the world and still be at SUU yep. uh, per, pursuing a degree. But, but so consequently um, – that they're they the flexibility they want continues to go up they, they're consistently wanting that on demand that that ability to create their own path that ability to to go at their own pace but given given COVID as well they're they sense a, a deep aspiration to make sure that they're not caught in financial woes that not only COVID exposed to them but also being products of the great recession and, and i say that because we're seeing that shift higher ed trends with majors that they're picking we're seeing a, a huge drive to more toward more stem degrees sure. as opposed to, to maybe more of the uh humanities degrees they're wanting more that that have that concrete makeup that will provide that job security and and they're also recognizing that gen z that they're going to be lifelong learners and they, studies have shown that they sincerely believe that their job will not be in existence as it currently is in 10 years, mm-hmm. 20 years. And so if they can't find the avenue to try something out, learn, try something out, learn, and, and continue to advance up the career ladder career that path. way, that's exactly right. And so, so institutions that can model or help them understand how what we're teaching in the classroom will help them because they're looking at it like by the time I learn something my freshman year, it's going to be outdated by the time I hit my senior year. 
That makes or how so is this applicable to, to me right now? And so we've got to start modeling what the workforce is, is slowly starting to recognize needs to happen, which is work, learn, work, learn, work, learn. And this is the rhythm that, that this generation's falling into. The, the four years of sit and listen is not going to be a productive model for this generation. You know, what's really interesting is I think that um, our listeners that are in hiring positions or management positions really need to tune into this because you're dealing with a generation of human beings that you're having to adapt to prior to them getting into the workforce. There's a lot of that that could be learned from folks like Chris and I and from other hiring managers and folks that are trying to inspire people, trying to help them to embrace the data, learn the information, implement, and then move to the next thing, get to the next thing. And that's what we've just hired 12 or 13 new people coming in that are from Gen Z, all recent graduates. And what we found is very much consistent with what you've talked about. They have a craving to learn the why. And I'm not talking about the why that fuels the heart and purpose. I'm talking about the why as to why the machine works the way that it works so I can understand how to articulate it so I can figure out how to master it to get to the next thing. Why, what defines Gen Z right now as it relates to like, what are they great at? And then what do corporations need to do to offset the parts that they're not great at to help them to achieve faster? I'm personally interested in your take on this because I I think, you know, the key is to fuel what they're great at and then to cover the part that they're weak at. That's what a great corporation should do until they start to get going. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here first and then Jared, feel free to jump in. Some of the key characteristics as far as what, what we're seeing, one, this is a very ambitious generation. It's a very financially minded, financially savvy generation. They do not want to accur- accrue debt. Uh, they they want to avoid debt. They, they view everything through a value relevance proposition. If what they're, you're asking them to do, if what you're asking to engage in does not meet that value relevance proposition, it either costs too much or it's not going to give them value in the, in the future or it's not relevant to where they're going or where their career, they're not going to do it. They're very creative. They're extremely open-minded. They're realists. They're extremely technically savvy. Uh, it's probably one of the most kind-hearted yes. generations you'll ever see because of what they've been faced and the diversity they've they've experienced. So they're always looking out for other people. They love the team environment. They're self-learning. YouTube is their number one go-to where if, if they need answers, they'll just go and, and figure it out. They crave growth. They crave opportunities for growth. They crave that learning. They're very innovative. They're pragmatic. They're focused on the world as a whole, and they want to understand how they fit in Mm -hmm. to this cog, which is called the world, very focused in on the future. And they're probably the most entrepreneurial generation uh, we've ever experienced. Those are some of the, I think, defining characteristics that make this generation so awesome. I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of folks that listen to this that pause that, play it back, then pause it again and play it back. Then call seven people in the room that are in management roles to go listen to this and then play that because that was priceless. Uh, Dr. Tibbetts, you've got uh, some pressure here to live up to what Dr. Kirby just said because it was really golden. So let's go. Well, he, he, no truly pressure. Is a, <laughs> he truly is an expert on Gen Z. Um, in fact, Eric and I go out and work with corporations Um who are trying to f- manage this whole transition with bringing Gen Z on and try to help them think through those pieces. It, one of the things that's so interesting, you, you asked this question about what, what are they good at and what are they not good at? And here's what's so interesting about this is the things that you and I think they're not good at, if we'll actually, um, if we'll actually take a step back and just let them be good at what they're good at, usually it overcomes what you and I think they're not yeah. good at. And, and we, have a tendency as Gen Xers and and Boomers and those who are running the corporations, we want to put Gen Z employees in a box. We want them to behave the way we behave. Mm-hmm. And so we get frustrated when they want flexible work schedules. And we interpret that as they don't want to work hard. They'll work hard. They just want to work on their own time because it's back to this piece about why, right? They're constantly asking like, why do we have to work from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m.? Yeah, says who? In particular, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not, social right? construct, right? They want to <laughs> yeah, break the social all, constructs. 
That's right. Everything that is been the way it's always been, they want to ask why. That's what really makes them strong. And their weaknesses, um, like any generation, you know, we, I guess, all have our weaknesses. And, of course, as we talk here, we're painting with a really broad brush, and not everyone sure. fits into these. these but we uh, are right, though. <laughs> just for your listeners, just in case, you know, listening in, you were like, are they right? No, the answer, we are right. So go ahead. <laughs> That's right. So, um, but yeah, I think we, as, particularly as managers and leaders, we do have to pause and ask, is the way we do things really the best way? Um, and if we will just say, here's the challenges, here's where we want to go and give them some freedom to be creative and flexible, um, at least we find it even in the higher ed setting, right? You're not going to find an organization that's more set in its ways and traditions than higher education. Yes. Um, but when we go to students and say, what are the challenges you are experiencing and facing and help us create solutions and, and um, avenues for fixing these sorts of things, yeah, they come back with some really awesome ways to do it, very differently than how I would solve it. And it's usually better than how I would have solved it. There's a really yeah, interesting right. point that there's a really interesting thing that we have uh, going currently. And, and I've, I've heard it not only in our own organization, but I've also talked to managers and executives that are dealing with Gen Z and want the best for them and want them to be absolutely phenomenal. And we obviously all know that anytime you hire a person, it's an investment and you're losing money until you're not. Um, and getting them up to a level of productivity and retention um, is a daunting task. What I find is there's this is and this is going to be interesting because we've had this thing about they're very entitled. I don't think they are. I think they're the exact opposite. I think they don't feel entitled. There's a level of entitlement that you have to have in order to be successful that you have. Uh, you deserve to ask why to a client. You deserve to be able to challenge a client to think outside the box. You deserve, you have the right to think that you're on the same playing field, that you can challenge that client on the other end of the line. And what I found in many cases is some of these folks, and maybe it's a you thing as they're transitioning, but I think that there's, um, there's, there's this challenge that they're dealing with of feeling the entitlement to get, to get in the game and to really, really believe that they are the title that they're in. I, I, I've, I've found this kind of disconnect, which I got to tell you, I've been managing people for 25 years and 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you said, Hey, look, challenge the client, they're like, Oh, cool. I can do that. And, um, that has been an interesting, uh, difference in this generation there. You're right. They are very kind. They are very polite and they are very creative. Uh, but we, we are seeing a struggle for them to buy into the fact that, I have the right to ask questions of the client. I have a right to advise. Is that, a, is that something that you see as well, or am I just completely coming from out of space on this? No, I, I, I think you're spot on. I think what we view maybe as entitlement is just their inquisitive nature. Okay. I think what we view in, as entitlement is simply their, their desire to understand and, and push the envelope on certain things as far as why are we doing what we're doing. Yeah. And and one thing I found with this generation is they're consistently looking for easier ways to do things. And consequently, we, we may dub them lazy, but in, it's, it's actually, actually brilliant if you think about it. it like, if, if it's you, efficiencies. If, you know, as Jared was talking, if you give them that autonomy and whatnot, uh, they're going to surprise you. And I think that's where managers and bosses often screw up with young employees of Gen Z is we try to fit them into this box or mold. This is a generation that highly values individualism and, and not fitting in with social norms. And so create, creating a, a, a large framework for them to operate in, but then letting them figure out how to operate in that framework is probably one of the best things you can do uh, with Generation Z. But, but hiring managers, they, they've got their tasks and their work cut out for them, just like higher education. I, if, if you look at, for example, how we hire Generation Z, LinkedIn did a study. It was like from 2017 to 2022. They looked at all entry-level positions, and it was like 48% of entry-level positions all required three years of experience. Okay, so it makes so zero why sense. Are you requiring experience How is it entry level? Entry level? <laughs> and and so so what's the challenge is Gen Z is very authentic. So if you're saying you need three years of experience, I don't have they're that. not applying at your business because yeah. they don't have it. This generation is like 22% less likely to be working than millennials or, or other pre during their teenage years. 
And so even just the, the hiring of it, we're, we're not advertising or providing flexible work arrangements, which is, is what they're craving. And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. We're not highlighting in the job applications or, or in our onboarding or anything how they're going to impact the company, how they're going to impact their community, and, and how their purpose fits into the larger goals or mission of their, the organization, which is what they want. They're not seeing authentic hiring managers or managers in companies who are actually walking the values that we're talking about mm-hmm. during, during the hiring process. They want to know that if you're saying well-being is a top priority for the company, they want to know in the interview how is well-being taken care of in the walls of your company on a daily basis. I love this. We are, not, we are not emphasizing the corporate social responsibility or or efforts that we're doing as business. We're on, we are not providing the proper onboarding to retraining. We're not using technology appropriately for this generation. We're not providing opportunities for growth, for development, for advancement. There is no clear chain of here's what you're going to learn and this is what the outcome will be. So consequently, they're jumping ship and we view them as non-committal. We may view them as not loyal. When in reality, when you understand the way they're thinking, they want job security. And if they do not see a path for continued growth education, that they're going to go find that elsewhere. If you can provide it, I think you're going to find some of the most creative, loyal, and transformative individuals um, that, that you could you could ever find. Feedback is not happening. Downward, upward feedback, upward, downward feedback is not happening. Mentorship isn't happening. Uh, cultures are, are being responsive to this, this positive nature. So there, there's so many things that organizations have to tweak. Higher ed's got their own issues to worry about. Yeah. But if businesses and organizations don't start responding to the needs of Generation Z, which by 2030 is going to make up about 30% of the workforce. And the buyers. Yeah. And the buyers, you, you're going you're gonna to be in some pretty big trouble. Well, and you had a couple of points there, Eric, that I, I think really resonated with me with my interaction with Gen Z through the years is you mentioned the the value alignment and just in general, I feel like from a brand perspective, the brands that they choose to interact with, how they interact with the brands, ultimately the companies that they may choose to work for, the school they choose, a program they choose, it's all in alignment. And it all goes back to them understanding that why and asking those questions and ultimately trying to make sure everything is connected. Um, and I think that's just an overarching theme that I've seen is just this desire to have a cohesive, stable environment, whether that's where you're working, whether that's at home life, whatever that is, it, it bleeds into everything. Um, is that something you've seen with your students? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the buzz phrase there that I think I think validates the, the point you just made there, Chris, is this this is a generation that wants to be spoken with, not spoken to. Mm-hmm. And they expect that of companies, they expect that of works, they expect that of, of institutions. And previous generations, you could speak at them, you could speak to them. And, and what does it mean to speak with them? You start realizing the individual nature of that and how your message, your values, your your everything has to start being crafted to, to showcase how you're with them along this educational or career journey uh, instead of I've got a one size fit fits all approach welcome to this part of education or this part of high or the workforce it's no secret dr dr Tibbetts that people still want to be led I don't care how old you are um, I don't care what your background is People still want to be mentored. They still want to learn. They still want to be inspired. They still want to be led. How, how is this generation best approached in that regard? Is it less communication or more communication? Is it granular pieces on a more regular basis with more repetition? Is it a classroom setting or is it a constant hour by hour, hey, encouragement? What have you found as it relates to higher education and how they need to be inspired to be their best version of themselves? We talk, maybe that's an overused term, but I really think it is an important term. How are you seeing that folks um, in Gen Z want to be inspired in that regard? In the Club is powered by Club Colors. Club Colors is the premium marketing solution for all branded apparel and promotional products utilized to drive your brand awareness and brand success. From concept to doorstep, Club Colors can source over 9 million different product solutions, decorate your logo, create custom kitting solutions, 
manage all logistics, and build, manage, and curate your company online store. The full, comprehensive, all-in-one solution for your brand. Our brand promise is right solution, right place, right time. Allow Club Colors to create an inspiring brand experience for you and your team. Check us out at www.clubcolors.com.